Uh, welcome everybody. As you guys know, my name is Joyce. Uh, my native name, my given name, is Das Romas Samogat Laha, which translates into English, Angel. And, um, yeah. Uh, and my given name is Tim Huan, and my English name is Ricky. Uh, we would just like to call Dawn up right now for the land acknowledgement. Um, is there anyone who's new here today who hasn't been before? <laughs> yes, <laughs> you've got Rosie. Welcome, welcome. Um, um, so I wanted to say that we're very, very thankful to our Creator, God, who made this land that we get to live on and stand on. And we're deeply grateful and thankful to the indigenous people of the Coast Salish Nations, Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh, whose traditional and ancestral land this is and who've been caretakers for thousands of years. We have so much to learn from them. And we want to extend um, uh, a blessing towards them, a blessing for flourishing. And we as a community want to commit to walk the way, uh, the journey in a good way with the Indigenous Coast Salish people. Um, so that's our acknowledgement. But part of why we do this is that we're in this journey of building relationship with Coast Salish people. So the land acknowledgement is one part. It's not the be all and end all. It's a commitment to walk the way. So as a community, we've been, we visited the nations, we brought gifts from our church members, and um, we've received a welcome. Our Musqueam have been very kind to invite us to go and visit them. So we've had this, this beginning of a relationship to find ways of partnering and serving with them, and we're deeply grateful for their welcome. Um, and we'd like to invite Michel Boissonneau to come and just open our time in prayer. And just a little background story, two hours before this event, Michel got a little nudge from God. He, he saw himself like going up and praying for in front of a church. And look at him being asked. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our Father, our Creator, God, as we know him here on this land, Jesus Christ. I pray today that, uh, I want to pray today um, in thanks, in thanks for uh, Hubert Barton uh, for being here to talk with us, to give us his experience um, uh, so far. And uh, I just want to say myself how incredibly grateful and uh, I am to be a part of this congregation, a congregation that reaches out and as Don mentioned, walks the walk as well as talks the talk. So, Lord, we ask that you bless this evening and each and every member here. And uh, we thank you again, Lord, for everything you do with us. Amen. Amen. So this series, um, uh, this part of it, it's our last one. <laughs> yes. We're doing good. We're doing good. Uh, so this last one is with Hubert. And uh, we have... Um, yeah, this comes from our Strathcona Vineyard Church, and uh, again, that uh, working um, to seek justice and reconciliation, uh, healing uh, between Indigenous people and church. So this is us, uh, again, like what we've heard, uh, walking the talk. Um, this has been two and a half months now so this has been really awesome to to have the different ones come and um, as you know we're we are uh, having small groups in between so uh, those of us from our church have been meeting 
Um, so we just encourage also to uh, be aware of uh, different questions uh, that you have, that you might have, write them down, send them to your group leader. Yes, and uh, it is our hope and prayer that God will continue to use this process, not merely uh, expand knowledge, but to lead us on paths of righteousness as we seek to follow Jesus as members of the body of Christ. And now I have the honor of introducing our speaker. Um, so uh, tonight we have the pleasure of hearing from Hubert Barton, and he's from the north coast of British Columbia, from the Aniska community that is called, I'm sorry, I didn't learn how to, to pronounce this beforehand. Do you mind just speaking it for us? Gingolf. 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 <laughs> okay, so right at the mouth of the Nass River, Hubert holds a master's degree from the Vancouver School of Theology and is currently program coordinator of Vancouver School of Theology's Indigenous Studies program. One of the projects he helps to lead through the VST is called the Teaching House That Moves Around, great name, um, which partners with Indigenous communities and leaders to identify local ministry needs and provide teaching resources to help address those needs. So popular courses that they have offered include Ministry in the Midst of Trauma and Indigenous Christology. So tonight, Hubert will be speaking to us on the topic, What Christian Theology Needs to Learn from Indigenous Perspectives. And we just are so grateful for what he brings and what he's offering us today. So if I can invite Hubert to come up. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. It's good to see all of you guys. I gotta say, this is probably the most formal setup I've ever had to speak in front of. <laughs> it feels like I'm gonna have to defend something here. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's just, it's, yeah. I'm a Yuxa. Good evening. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank God for today, and I'd like to thank you all for having me. I'd like to thank you all for uh, welcoming me. Um, yeah, I appreciate you welcoming me, and I definitely appreciate your prayers. Uh, we, I met Probably back in Jan June, January, feels like a long time ago because we were so away from Omicron, this whole big deal, and we met and started uh, talking about what I could share, and I was given that topic, and then I was also kind of felt stirred to share uh, one of the things that I've been sharing about quite a bit, but it has also helped me quite personally, and it's helped a lot of my the people that I've shared it with, it's the parallels that I've managed to find between my Christian faith um, and my Mishka culture. So, the, and especially the parallels I've managed to find between my Christian faith and Ishka culture, or as I, as I like to call it, Christ fingerprints throughout my culture, and my Ishka ways of knowing and being. And I hope that by sharing this, I can show you that indigenous spirituality, our culture, our ways of knowing and being aren't as different as, aren't as different as you might think. But are there differences? Yes. But there are a lot of similarities and parallels that have between that I've managed to find that has given me a lot of life, and these parallels have uh, given not only a lot of life to my Christian faith, but it has given a lot of life to my uh, my, my indigenous mm -hmm. identity, because it has also helped me to become more comfortable in my own skin mm -hmm. as someone who is both indigenous and Christian. Mm -hmm. I want to introduce myself a little bit more because it'll. I want to tell you where I come from. It will help give a setting and a context to what I will be sharing about. I will be sharing about the things that I have been sharing about. I will be sharing about the things that I have been sharing about. I will be My Nishka name is Running Wolf. I am a member of the Nishka Nation. I am from the Wolf Clan, from the community of Gingol. I am from the house of the chief, Nislisian. I am from the Nishka Valley. Now, the Nishka Valley is located in the north coast of British Columbia. Um, if you're familiar with the geography, like Alaska's up here, British Columbia comes down. We want this way. Alaska's up here. <laughs> British Columbia comes down, and there's a panhandle that comes down. We're right at the tip of the panhandle, and that's my home community, Gingol, where I'm from. 
Uh, the Nishka Valley is made up of four communities. Uh, the furthest inland would be Gitlach Damix. Uh, they're, they're the biggest, they're roughly 2,000 people or so. And then you journey in towards the coast. About 15 minutes along the highway, you arrive to another town. It's the smallest in our valley. It is called uh, Gitwin Silk. Uh, you drive a little further alongside some lava beds, alongside the river, along through the valley, along through the mountains. You arrive to another community called Lachkalza. They're very similar in size to my community, around 350 to 400 people or so. You journey once more towards the coast. Uh, you have about a 30 minute drive, you drive alongside the Nass River along a windy road, alongside some mountains. It's one of the most beautiful drives you can take. Mm -hmm. And you drive to my hometown, Gingol, which is on the, on the slide there. Uh, that's where I'm from, uh, Gingol, BC. I, mm -hmm. I live where the mouth of the Nass River meets the coast. Mm -hmm. uh, you could literally hop over a couple of mountains, you'd be in Alaska territory. For the most part, we're very untouched by the outside world. Uh, we have a few small mom and pop type shops that sell non perishable food items, fast foods. Up until a few years ago, we only had uh, dirt roads, we didn't have any cell phone service. Uh, it's, and we get a lot of tourists there recently since we've been connected with our highway since uh, the early 2000s, and uh, the tourists always call it God's country. Uh, it's so peaceful, it's so beautiful. We get, we get, because we stay at the mouth of the Nass River, we get the best of both salt water and freshwater sea life. Mm -hmm. So we get like cockles, clams, all five species of salmon, we get prawn, uh, we get halibut, we get moose, we get deer, we get all kinds of berries, we get sea lime. Uh, Kinkol is actually a nickname of the seafood capital of the Nass. Mm -hmm. And it's so beautiful and peaceful. Like one of my favorite things about going home is when I, because I stay pretty central on the, on the waterfront area there, I could just stick my head out the window and I can hear the eagles in the air screeching. Mm -hmm. I could hear the waters of the two rivers rushing by me. And I'm the youngest of four brothers and one sister. Um, my dad is Hubert Barton Sr. My mother is the late Bonita Barton. Like I said, I'm the youngest of four brothers and one sister. I moved here in 2016 because I really felt called to step out of my comfort zone and to grow and to stretch and to bend. Uh, to stretch and, to bend. and I was working on my MDiv at the time. Uh, I was working at a distance. I wasn't the best distance student because life kept happening and I was going through a lot of health struggles. Uh, one, one time I, I just felt of this something stirred inside me and it just called me to, to move and I, and I decided to listen to it. I kind of I left home, I, was, I kind of felt like Abraham, you know, I left my house, I left my father, and left my land, came to the big city of Vancouver. I've been living here since 2016. I've been studying, I studied at the Vancouver School of Theology through the Indigenous Studies program. And in 2019, I graduated with my Master of Divinity. And uh, fortunately, I'm blessed enough that I'm now coordinating the program that I graduated from. Mm. It's, been, it's been quite the journey uh, to, to see where I came from to where I am now. Because there was a point in my life, like 10 years ago, where I used to live on social assistance and $300 a month. And I had no aspirations to do anything. And I'm um, in Vancouver coordinating the program that I never ever thought I'd be dreaming about. Coordinating and working mm -hmm. alongside uh, Ray Oldridge, who's been sent here recently. He's a great friend and tormentor. I mean, mentor. He's a huge friend. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to share, now that I gave you a little bit of a setting, I want to share a couple of scriptures. Just two main ones, mainly. The first one would be from Colossians 1 15 to 20. It reads, The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in him everything might have so in him that everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Amen. And the second verse comes from Matthew. Matthew 25, 31-40. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right 
and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whether you did it for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. And I share this just because I want to give us a little bit of a focal point because I wanted to just to get us an idea that you know, we're in Christ, he meets us in creation, that Christ made his dwelling among us, that all things were created to him and for him, and that in him all things hold together. But also, especially like in Matthew, it shows that Christ meets us in some of the most unexpected places, some of the most unexpected, beautiful places. In an essay from Stan McKay, he mentions that you can think of indigenous peoples as Old Testament people, you know, like the Jewish people. Indigenous peoples are deeply rooted in creator, and we are deeply rooted in creation. Just like Moses, indigenous peoples understand the sacredness of the earth. We understand the sacredness of the promise of land. We have creation stories that talk about and display the awesome power of the great wisdom of the creator when it comes to the creation of all life. Like Abraham, we understand visions we get the laughter of Sarah. And we have even known people like Pharaoh. We have ceremonies and rituals that honor and bring us closer to God. We are story people with ways of knowing and being that reflect the nature of God, which is one of the reasons why when indigenous peoples heard the gospel of Christ, most of us gravitated towards it because the teachings of Jesus have a lot of similarities to the indigenous people's own morals and values. And I am I learned this a lot through my academic studies that it became easy for me to understand Jesus, you know, his time on earth, because he was a Jewish person living in a Hellenistic culture, mm -hmm. trying to maintain his identity while under an imperial force. Mm -hmm. yeah. That couldn't have been an easy thing. <laughs> that couldn't have been an easy thing. So I was able to understand that, like in the Old Testament, when it talks about being at the, the Israelites when they lived on the edges of the cities and towns and there were farmers who lived off the land. It was easy for me to relate to that. Mm -hmm. and so for the most part, that's how I was able to read it. But also when I did my final major paper, I did it on Joshua too. And I, for the first time ever, I saw myself as the king, as the, the Canaanites, mm -hmm. because they were, they, were getting, they were about to be conquered by, you know, God's people. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, that was a really tough one to write in my paper, but it was also very helpful. So I was able to see from all these different perspectives, you know, but again, like just to be able to see and understand what the Bible was saying, especially with Jesus in his time, I was able to re relate to him because I understand, you know, his, him trying to maintain his identity, living in a kind of world that is trying to change him into something else. I've always thought of myself as a pretty simple person, especially in my theology. And bottom line, God loves us. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. But I kind of found out that I'm not as simple as I think or I would like to be. So bear with me as I get a little nerdy tonight. <laughs> I'll share some theology with you. I will share it because not only is it the foundation on which I began to, to discover the parallels, but it also gives me the peace of heart mm -hmm. to be able to do so. Mm -hmm. So as my uncle would say, bear with me, I'll bear with you. Together we'll get that bear. <laughs> so journey with me through some theology, and then once we get through the theology, I will share some stories that will help bring some light to the theology and the parallels of Christ's fingerprints throughout my Nishka culture that has helped me to be who I am. To understand Christ and Nishka culture, we first need to understand his relationship in the Trinity and learn a little bit about the nature of the Trinity itself. Doing this will help us see Christ's fingerprints throughout my Nishka culture. The Trinity itself can be a model for us to follow as human beings. We need to follow the example of the perfect fellowship of the Trinity that is displayed through the Father, through the Son, through the Holy Spirit, and reflect the nature of the three persons of the Trinity 
in our own personal and communal lives. The Trinity shows us how we need to be in relationship with one another, how we need to behave toward one another. The Trinity is made up of the three divine persons of God, existing in eternal communion as one. Everything we are, everything we have, is because of God who exists in the perfect fellowship of the Trinity, in the community of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The three persons of the Trinity are the creative forces sustaining all things in perfect unity. All groups, churches, all of society, and all of humanity are being kept by the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are always acting together, always creating and saving and bringing us into communion of life and of love. We as human beings ought to be in communion with one another, just as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are in communion with, him, with each other. The Trinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have coexisted since all eternity. They have no beginning and they have no end. When it comes to the hierarchy of the three persons of the Trinity, no one is before the other, no one is superior or inferior to the other. Instead of viewing the Trinity in a hierarchical way, I tend to view it as a partnership, a relationship. Each person of the Trinity needs the other and finds their being in the other, and without the other, they would be lost. The three persons of the Trinity are so close to one another that each person of the Trinity permeates the other person of the Trinity while allowing themselves to be permeated. Basically, each person in the Trinity dwells in the other. They find their being in, each, in the other. And the Council of Florence in 1441 said that, the Father is holy in the Son, and holy in the Holy Spirit. The Son is holy in the Father, and holy in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is holy in the Father, and the holy in the Son. None precedes the other in eternity, none exceeds the other in greatness, or excels the other in power. Each person of the Trinity is equal with each other, and are so close to each other that they exist together as one. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit exist in such perfect fellowship that they never act without one another. The three persons of the Trinity are never separate. Each person of the Trinity dwells in the other. They exist together in the perfect unity of love as equals, which reveals to us their divine nature. It is this very divine nature in which they self-communicate and model for us of an undamaged explosion of love one toward another. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are eternally pouring themselves forth toward one another that they form a single movement of love to be for each other and the pouring out forth of the self toward one another is the fundamental characteristic of each divine person of the Trinity. The three persons of the Trinity are always for the other, working through the other, with one another, and in each other. Each person of the Trinity totally surrenders to themselves, to the other, and gives of, them, gives of themselves life, love, wisdom, goodness, gives of, gives of themselves everything possessed. The giving of themselves shows us a great example of mutual surrender, reciprocal communion, and community. We'll take a quick look at the closer look at the divine persons of the Trinity, starting with God above, God the Father. Calling God Father reveals to us many different aspects of his nature. Father expresses us a deep involvement in relationship, a deep commitment, a deep compassion. Father can be a loving protector, a loving nourisher, a sustainer. Even if, even if we become unfaithful or stray or fail, our Father remains faithful and continues to love us because that is who He is. The second person would be God alongside us, the Son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the Son, calls God Father, Abba, which indicates to us a very close and unique relationship. A relationship is tender, intimate, kind, and grounded in care and compassion. Jesus is a gift of divine love that allows the people of the church to become a channel of divine light, divine love, and of God through the Son, Jesus Christ. Now, the third person of the Trinity is God, the Holy Spirit, who is present and active in us, in our very own hearts. The Holy Spirit is the force inside each and every one of us and drives us, impels us, keeps us united in love with God, united with the world and united with each other. The Holy Spirit enables us in hope to be able to overcome any and every obstacle that may come our way. The Holy Spirit unites us with all of creation and even teaches us how to pray when we just can't find the words. You know, each person of the Trinity and their title, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, reveals to us their relationship with each other, relationships that are grounded in love, love that is constantly pouring itself forth in abundance pouring itself forth excessively, 
pouring itself forth unendingly and pouring itself forth freely. We see through the Trinity a great example of what it truly means to be in relationship with one another and what it is like to truly freely give of oneself to the other and to be in community and it is all motivated by love, which is the very nature of the Trinity. The reality of the Trinity has always been found throughout human history. It is only after people began to realize that the reality of the three divine persons of the Trinity that many different issues of doctrine began to arise. It isn't just about doctrine, though. Throughout history, the Trinity has never revealed itself as doctrine. Instead, the Trinity has revealed itself as practice. The Trinity reveals itself as practice through the actions, through the words, and through the deeds of Jesus Christ and through the actions of the Holy Spirit, not only in the world, but also in the people of this world. More than anything, the Trinity calls us to action by showing us the different ways we practice love, kindness, and self-giving, because that is the way the Trinity has revealed itself in history. Everyone okay so far? Mm -hmm. Hang in there. <laughs> We're getting close to the stories. <laughs> And stories, as I mentioned, that will help see, will bring light to a lot of the parallels that I've, that I've found. And I don't know about you, but when I, when I was journeying through academia, all of this nerdy stuff, that I, stuff that I just went through, it needed to be accompanied by stories in order for it to bring it home for me. So that's what, that's my hope, that I, what I hope to do right now. I read a book by Peter J. Lightheart, Lightheart called Traces of the Trinity. Lightheart helped me to see clearly how there are knowable and traceable, visible and traceable traces of the Trinity in creation and itself. Being able to see the traces of the Trinity in creation made the reality of the Trinity become so alive for me. Lightheart found traces of the Trinity in everyday life experiences from the sounds we hear, music, creation, and human relationships. And it helped me to see the Trinity in such a different way. One, well, because I, I never really gave the Trinity much thought. But it also helped me to see the Trinity and the nature of it in our everyday lives. One of the very first words is when I saw how the church is a great example of the Trinity because people gather together to worship God and the Holy Spirit because of what Jesus has done. It's pretty simple, right? Mm -hmm. But for me, this was so helpful for me. Through traces of the Trinity, I began to get excited because I could relate to a lot of the things that were being shared. Mm -hmm. And I, I got strongly reminded of my own Mishka culture and traditions as I began to see the Trinity and the nature of the Trinity, the nature of God, the nature of the Holy Spirit, the nature of Jesus in my own culture. I'll share with you how I began to find these traces of the Trinity in my own Mishka culture. In my Mishka culture, the word we use for God is Gamliki Hashash. Gamliki Hashash is the word we use for God, and it's the word we had before contact with the Europeans. Gamliki Hashash translates literally into supernatural. And it was Gamligi Ahash who created the universe. Gamligi Ahash created the sun, he created the moon, the stars, our home, Mother Earth, and he is the one who created the Mishka people and gave us the ways of learning and being. Gamligi Ahash, he had a grandson. His grandson's name was Tanksen. Tanksen was sent here to Earth, and he was the one who placed the Mishka and I made in the Nishka Valley. He was the one who gave shape to the Nass River after the great flood that covered the entirety of our land, except for one small point in the tallest mountain in our valley. In our Nishka stories, it is said that there was a great flood that covered all the land. The people who survived the flood managed to get to a mountain top. That one right there. They managed to get to a mountain top in our valley. And it was there they offered up prayers to Gamligi Ahach along with down feathers. They offered prayers nonstop until one day the waters began to recede. And when the waters began to recede, they saw thousands and thousands of rainbows appear in the sky. And then it said that when this happened, our ancestors saw a vision of a man walking on the water. It was handsome. He was, he was giving shape to our valley and putting our place, our communities back in place. Mm -hmm. My mind kind of got blown when I heard that, when I kind of learned that because I'm like, to walk on water, you got to be in some pretty elite company. <laughs> <laughs> Tanks and 
is a type of, he, well, he's not a type, he is a messenger. He is also a trickster. He embodies both the best of humanity and the worst of humanity. But just in my mind, that reminded me of how Christ came. He was perfect and spotless, but took on the sins of the world. Mm -hmm. He also brought us light. He banished out the darkness. There's a story in my, in my Mishka culture where Tamsam, the grandson, uh, he played in the heavens with his, with his, with his grandfather. And there was, a, there was an orb on the wall, like right there, and he'd go ask for it. And grand, grandfather, grandfather, can I play with it? Can I play with it? And eventually the grandfather just let him play with it. And Tamsam would have fun and play with the ball. But at the end of the day, the grandfather would always take the ball back and put the light back on the wall. And then Tamsam was like, can I play with it? Can I play with it? He just loved that ball. And then the grandfather said, okay, okay, go ahead, play with it. But this time Tamsam, being the trickster that he is, he took the ball of light and he went down to earth where the Michigan people were, already are. At this point, we were living in semi-darkness. You know, we, we had no full light yet. And Tamsam went by the river with the ball of light and he, was, he saw some fishermen there catching holokin. And he started talking to them and having a conversation with them. And he asked, he asked them for some holokin. Can, can I have a piece of holokin? Can I have a piece of holokin? And they, they made fun of Tamsam. They told him no. But Tamsam knew in his heart who these people were. He knew that they were, they, were, they were darkness. He knew that they were ghosts. And so he ripped open that ball of light and cast out the darkness and gave the Nishka people light. That is Tamsam. Tamsam is also the one who helped us and gave us our ways of knowing and being as well. He gave us our ayub, which is our nishkat law. Because our ways of knowing and being, our ayub involves everything from the way we host feasts, the way we handle death, and the way we relate to each other and help each other as nishkat people. The men have roles to play, the women have roles to play, even the children have roles to play. But we are not limited to that one role. We can move and prune those roles freely if we choose to. Just because we have roles to play in our culture doesn't make anyone lesser or better than the other. In our Nishka way, there is no lesser or greater. We are all equal and come to you. Instead, we need each other. If anyone in our group were to stop doing their role, the other would be lost without them. So we need each other, and we show each other great respect because of this need for each other. Now we also have Nahna, which is the spirit. Just as in the scriptures you have gifts of the Spirit, or fruit of the Spirit, it is Nahnah who blesses us with gifts. These gifts come in different forms. You could be a spiritual leader, a great hunter, a doctor, a great storyteller, amongst many other great gifts given by Nahnah. The way these gifts are given is through a spiritual leader. This leader is called the Halite. That is a picture of a halite, one of our spiritual leaders of antiquity, but we don't have them as much anymore, or um, at all, I think. But there's a ceremony involved where, you know, young children, they gather together, and they sit on the floor in a circle, and they are covered with a blanket. And then the halite, he comes and starts performing a ceremony. And when the ceremony begins, you can feel nah, nah, the spirit begins to move, he begins to stir. And then the halite sort of reaches out, catches the spirit, and he lays his hands on the children. And gifts are then imparted to the children. This reminded me of the book of Acts when Peter and John laid their hands on people and the Holy Spirit was then imparted to them. A few winters ago, I got to visit home. I got to see family and friends. I got to sit with one of my elders and ask him questions and hear his, hear his answers, to hear his stories. I asked him questions and listened to the wisdom and the teachings and the stories he was telling me. He shared with me a lot of what I just shared with you. Near the end of his sharing, in my curiosity, I asked him, was like, so come lady, me, and this is from my, my theology point of view, coming from my MDiv, I'm like, come lady, does that mean we have three gods? He smiled at me and he quickly went on to say, He's like, no, no, it doesn't mean we have three gods. He shared with me another short story with me of how our ancestors, when they observed the things around them, when they looked closely at the life around them, they looked at the sun, they looked at the moon, they looked at the stars, the mountains, the rivers, the trees, the animals. They saw that all life and everything in creation 
was connected. And so they said, our God is one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you said that. I just about fell out of my chair. Mm -hmm. <laughs> my mind was blown and I just couldn't help but smile as I learned this. And then I was wondering, and I was also wondering at the end of that sharing, like why in my Mishka tradition is Gamalidi Hash and Tamsam? Why, why are they grandson and why are they grandpa? Mm -hmm. Then I thought about the grandson and grandpa relationship in my culture. We have this tradition, which I'm glad these chairs are here. It doesn't practice as much anymore, but I learned this from another elder in my community. We have this tradition where you place two chairs, one chair, two chairs, and they're facing each other. The grandfather would sit on one chair and the grandson would sit on the other. The grandson would be, the grandson, father would begin by asking the grandson, so grandson, how are you doing? The grandson would respond by saying something like, oh, you know, I'm okay. But then the grandfather would say, no grandson, how are you really doing? Mm -hmm. This is a practice that helped build and strengthen relationships. The grandfather would help the grandson and teach the grandson and help him to grow and to learn. They would both be learning from each other. This practice reminded me in the Gospel of Luke of how Jesus, when he often went to quiet places to pray, to spend time with his father. And I'm pretty sure this practice was practiced through many of the different relationships in Manishka culture. The Nishka Ayuk means Ayuk means law. It's a Nishka law, it's our ways of knowing and being. Men's and women's roles, typically men are out hunting and fishing. Women are home working on food preservation, among many other things. And women are considered to be the backbone of, my, of our nation. Especially, especially our grandmothers. Kids are watched to see which gifts they have been blessed with, and then they work with people who have similar gifts so that they can grow in their gifts. Mm -hmm. We are not stuck and limited to one role. If someone wants to hunt, then they hunt. If someone wants to preserve, then they preserve. Our roles are not set, and there's a lot of flexibility in our roles. And if one group were, again, if one group were to stop performing in their role, it would make things fall apart for the other person. It, it, it's about a relationship. It's about a partnership. You know, we need each other in these roles. One is not above, one is not below. We are all equal. And in most cases today, we see women and children working together and learning together when it comes to our Mishka ways of knowing and being. And when Nishka, uh, I share a little bit of the paternity and how they, they freely give of themselves. My Nishka culture does a very, very beautiful job of self-giving the way Christ self-gave himself and poured out everything of himself. Um, probably one of the most beautiful and biggest ways you'll ever see it happen is when we have a death in our valley. Because when one suffers, we all suffer. Um, there's perhaps something prepared here, but I'm gonna share a little bit of, from my heart. When my mother passed away in 2010, that kind of set me on the path that I'm on. That's when my relationship became real with God. But that's also when my culture became really alive for me, when I began to see clearly why this is the way we do things. You know, my mother, she was 55 when she passed away. One day she was here, the next she was gone. Mm -hmm. um, I remember that day so clearly. It was a Sunday, January 3rd. It was very clear, cold, sunny, and I woke up to some thud, thuds. And it was my dad running downstairs to wake me up. And he knocked on my door. He's like, son, son, son. He's like, mom's not doing well. Come on. And then I knew right away that it wasn't good. I knew right away that it wasn't good. And as soon as I got upstairs, I saw all my family in the living room. I saw my aunties and I saw my uncles. And then my mom was in her bedroom and I went to go see my mom in the bedroom and she couldn't say a word. And she couldn't say anything. And I couldn't say anything to her. Uh, several hours later, she was brought to the closest hospital in Terrace, uh, Terrace, BC, which is a two hour drive from Gingolf. And she got there at 6.15 p.m. and I was rubbing her back comforting her in true mother fashion. She was more worried about us than anything else. And then she took her last breath. When she took her last breath, my culture became activated like a level I'd never seen or experienced before. I had family and friends arriving from the Nishka Valley, from Terrace, from Prince Rupert, from Prince George, from Vancouver, all to be present with us. We were surrounded by family that entire time. And when the time came for my mother's remains to be brought home a couple of days later, 
I was in the procession and we, we arrived at the community and the entire community shut down. Everything closed. All the stores closed, our government offices closed, our health center closed. And they all came at the entrance to meet us and to greet us and to welcome us home with my mother's remains. And because of there, we all walked on foot together to bring her remains to the church where she lived for the initial first couple of days and then she was brought to our home. And in those times, I think it was about a week before we were able to lay her to rest. But during that time, my mother was from the Wolf Clan. There's four clans in my, in my, in my culture. There's the Wolf Clan, there's the Kilowell Clan, Eagle, and Raven. My mother was from the Wolf Clan. And anyone from the Wolf Clan wasn't allowed to do any type of work because like I said, when one suffers, we all suffer. And so they weren't allowed to do any type of business. So we had my dad's side of the family taking care of us when we arrived home. They were already waiting for us. They were already waiting inside our house. They, they wiped away our tears. They cooked for us. They held us. They cleaned our place. You know, they sang songs for us. They were completely present with us. And I just remember being surrounded by family and friends. And like I said, they came from all over the place, like all across BC, to be with us and to care for us and to love us. And then it came time for the funeral. And it came time to handle uh, the costs of the funeral. Again, my community and my, my nation was there for us. They gave so freely uh, of their finances. There's a bowl, it's called the common bowl. At the end of the feast, it's, happened, it, it, it's at every feast. It's how we help pay for everything that goes on when it comes to community gatherings and community uh, uh, feasts. It's placed at the head, and then everybody comes and gives of their own pockets, you know, their, finance, their finances to help pay for everything. And anywhere from 15,000 to like 50 to 70,000 can be raised at one of these feasts because, again, the people just show up and they give of themselves any way they can, including financially. But yeah, like, like I said, that was, I remember just going through that process and really, because I've been through that before, but I've never been through it personally like that. So I, I knew some of the protocols, I knew some of the ways of knowing your name, but it, it, that came so alive for me once it was personal for me. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot that I began to think about as I thought about the traces of the Trinity in my initial culture. But these are the main ones that I wanted to share with you in hopes that you would see the parallels between my Christian faith and my Nishka culture and see that we have a lot more in common than we might think. I wanted to share with you about Gandhi who for me, when I talk to my people, they could be like a type of trinity. I also wanted to share with you a little bit about how I saw a trace of the trinity and the nature of the trinity, you know, that divine love and how we work together as Nishka people, from our everyday lives to the way we host feasts, the way we give up the self, the way we are there for each other as a nation, and the way we are grounded in love and the giving of the self for the other so freely when it comes to our ways of knowing and being. For me and the rest of the Nishka nation, our ways of knowing and being can be summed up into one motto, Sight Gilam God, which means one heart, one path, one nation. And I hope that through a little bit of this theology and the nature of the person of the Trinity and the self-giving, the living in relation, the living in love, combined with a little bit of the Nishka stories and the experiences that I've been to help, help you to see that we have more in common than we think. Mm -hmm. And this has been a very significant learning for me because as an indigenous person, the way the gospel was brought to us, we were told that you either had to be one or the other. Mm -hmm. You could not be both indigenous and Christian. Mm -hmm. There's another story that I would like to share. When I first began this walk in 2010, which is also the time my Nishka culture became very alive, my Nishka ways of knowing became, and being became so alive for me, but I remember worshiping in church one day and I had my hand drum. You know, my little brown drum, the hand drum was my dad's drum, and had a picture of a killer wheel design on it. I come from a tradition where we worship, I come from a church army tradition where we worship with them drums and bass guitars, electric guitars, tambourines, uh, that type of thing. It's very lively. We sing, we clap, we dance, we raise our hand, we praise and worship. And I had my Nishka drum in one service. And I was using the drum just to drum along to the songs, you know. Victory is mine, victory is mine. And I'm just, just enjoying myself. And as I, I, at one of these services, someone got up, a visitor, 
And he began to share how he had a vision when, he, when I was playing that drum. And he said mud was being splattered all over the place. This mud was being splattered all over the place. And it was making the church dirty. But in, in reality, he was saying that I, w I wasn't supposed to be using my Nishka drum in the church, and that I shouldn't be doing it. And he was saying this, and as he was saying this, I wanted to share with bro. Like, you know, Jesus used mud to help a blind man see, right? <laughs> <laughs> Amen. I didn't, though. Like I said, I was early in my walk, and I was still very timid. I was still learning everything. And that's when I began to see how hard it can be to be both indigenous and Christian. Like I said, there was this time, this was the time my culture was becoming so alive for me. I joined my cultural dance group, and maybe a few months into my personal walk with God, I had these two groups. Two groups pulling at me. Mm -hmm. One group that because of the way Christianity was brought to us thought that I should not have anything to do with the church. Mm -hmm. That I should not have any and I should not have anything to do with my culture because I was a Christian. And there was this other group who were so deep in the culture that began because of the way Christianity was brought to us and the experiences that resulted thought I shouldn't have anything to do with Christianity. I was torn between uh, these two groups and I thought because I thought I was just being who God created me to be, indigenous and Christian. Then finally, after months had passed, and after reading my Bible, especially the Gospels, I thought that it wasn't about all the rules and the boxes and the do's and the don'ts. It was about Jesus. Mm -hmm. I finally made that choice for myself. I was like, okay, you guys are going to be miserable over there. You guys are going to be miserable over there. I'm going to be right here, being exactly who God created me to be, Nishka and Christian. And then fast forward a few years, I was studying at BST and in the Indigenous Studies program. I began to start to find all these parallels between my Nishka culture and my Christian faith. And it helped me immensely to be more who I was created to be. But especially it helped give me the peace in my heart. It gave me a lot of peace in my heart to be who I was created to be. And then, and then I began to learn and to rely on myself that it is both okay to be indigenous and Christian, despite you know, the history of it. And this has been something that has been very valuable for me. Like I remember going home uh, to celebrate the Nishka New Year, it's called OBA. And uh, the OBA, it's a two-day celebration where we celebrate the beginning of our harvest year. And we celebrate, celebrate it by the arrival of a small little fish called an olican. And it's, it's basically two days of feasting, it's two days of dancing and stories and tell us, storytelling and singing songs. And a lot of these songs are, are tell stories about our history. They tell stories about, you know, harvesting crabs, harvesting cockles and clams. We have welcome songs, we have peace songs and honor songs. We have spiritual songs, you know, like the David song. Um, and I remember there was this one time, I think it was in 2000, 18, I want to say, 2018 or 19, I got to go home. I was near the end of my MDF journey, and I had learned a lot of what I just shared with you. And I remember being hesitant to dance and celebrate before that, uh, just because of the history of it. And, but we said we were, I was performing with my cultural dance group, the Gimbal of Cultural Dancers, and we were singing the David song. I don't know if you know the David song. When the Spirit of the Lord moves in my heart, I will dance like David danced. Dim hogyash l'hadam godesh gu, dim hogyash l'shkedem ki. And we were singing that song, and it was our, it was our closing song. And say so this would be the performance floor, that would be the entrance, that would be the exit, and the, the, the women would be landed here, the drummers would be there, the halites. The people with the bear skins, the wolf skins would be over there, and the children would be dancing over there, the little warriors. And it came time to exit. We'd all go one by one, exit. And then we all got to that exit. And normally that's where we finish. And we'll just sing that song a cappella and just finish it really fast. But our director, he, he looked at us and he, he took his staff, started going like this. He pointed to us and pointed us to go onto the floor one more time. And then and when we did that, we all just went freely, just moved as freely as we could. People were singing, people were dancing. And I remember just going to the middle of the floor, singing my heart out, drumming, standing underneath the moon, and just remembering 
and everything that I've been through up until that point, both my struggle with people with indigenous and Christian, my, my, my Christianity, my indigenous spirituality, the choices that I had to make, you know, this is, gonna, this is who I am, this is who I was created to be. And I felt this rush, this total rush around me. I call it the spirit, you can call it the energy, you know, whatever you want to call it. But I, I felt this rush of the spirit move above me, below me, beside me, all around me. And I just felt like, felt like I was dancing in the air. And in that moment, I never felt, I imagine it, if I could look in a Corinthian, I can imagine it when God personally said to his son, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Because in that moment, I was like, I've never been more proud to be who I am. It's an Ishkat man who's walking this Christian road, living in a Western world. It's not an easy journey. It's never been an easy journey. And so I'm just grateful to be able to share with you a lot of these parallels that have given me so much life. I've shared it with some of my family, I've shared it with some of my friends, I've shared it uh, with churches, with other various churches, and I get mixed responses from overall they've been good. The overall they've been good that uh, out there, there was one time that was probably the most intense was when I had to, to talk about this in front of my hereditary chiefs. It was very similar to this. We were home for the teaching house, the teaching house that moves around, and I got to do a lecture. And that was, was Indigenous Christology, and they've, and again, like, it's still very present, the struggle to be Indigenous and Christian. Uh, but it's, it's, we're getting there. And so I shared this in front of like six of my hereditary chiefs. Oh man, I was so nervous. <laughs> I'm like, I'm lecturing about Christianity and culture here. Like, like these people have been around like twice as long, three times as long as I am. We've been there, done that, and here. Little old me coming back with my MD of still green kind of ears. <laughs> Can I share a little bit about what I've learned and what God has placed in my heart? But just their welcome and their response and just to see their pride in me and just to also learn that it is okay to be indigenous and Christian. And yes, there are differences. Yes, there are things that can't be put together. And uh, Ray asked me this one. I'm pretty sure it was him who asked me this time. Because I often get asked it, but all the time I was like, hey, am, I, am I trying to mix them together? I'm like, uh, not really. I'm like, I really loved my Christian heritage. You know, I grew up from a family who was Christian. I had uh, praying with our Christian grandmothers, Christian uncles, and my parents were Christian. And then I was also just kind of embraced my, my Michigan culture. And I'm just doing my best to hold these things together as best way as, as I can because they're both so amazing. They've both given me so much life that I do my best to honor them both and to carry them everywhere I go. And so that, that was, that's probably the main things that I wanted to share with you. I really hope it was helpful and I understand I'm bad in cleanup, which is a lot of pressure. <laughs> but I just, again, I just want to thank you all for, for having me and for welcoming me and especially for praying for me. Especially for praying for me. I felt your prayers and as I prepared for this. Because I normally don't do this type of thing where I prepare something so formally. I'll do my studies and I'll do my readings and and I just do my best to trust the spirit, but I wrote this, I deleted this, I wrote it again, <laughs> I edited it, I added it some things, I took some things away, but I just, I was like, I just came together, I'm just, I'm going to trust you, I'm going to share, and hope it helps, so, mm -hmm. don't listen to me. Mm Uh, this is, uh, as I mentioned, I moved here in uh, 2016. Uh, that was a long process. Like I told you, I felt something stir up inside of me that I was uh, called to move away from my community and like be Abraham, leave my house and leave my land. And I even sent a prayer request with my cousin Brenna who went to Korea. I think she went to, she said she went to a mountain, but she asked me if I wanted to have a prayer request and I told her, I kind of feel like I'm being called to move away in Vancouver to study full time. Mm -hmm. to work on my end of and she's like, okay, I'll pray for you, I'll pray for you. And 2016 happened, and this was Hobie 8, 2016. Uh, this is in Gifflet Dynamics, and we just performed before this. 
Uh, we just finished getting off the floor, so I was you know, cloud nine, I was just relaxed, and a lot of my dance group already went home. But I just sat there, and I just, I just sat there and took it all in, because I, I know I'll never get tired of my culture, especially my cultural song, I could sing it for days and days. But I remember sitting here, and just thinking to myself, I was like, man, we are a very blessed people. Mm. With our ways of knowing and being, the way we take care of each other. Mm. Like I'm going to show you with you how they, uh, my people took care of me when I lost my mother. Mm. How people give so freely of themselves or different protocols. I was like, we may not be wealthy in the sense of, well, we live in mansions, drive Mercedes Benzes, but okay. Man, we are rich people. Mm. Yeah, we are rich people. Mm. And I just, that's why I just snapped that picture. And I just, mm. That's what that picture is. Mm. This is the. I think that's Gitwin Silk, Canyon City, mm. cultural dancers. Mm. Thank you so much, uh, Hubert. Oh, sorry, I um, We're going to move into a time of some questions and answers, so if I could just invite you to continue to stay where you are, and then maybe on that microphone, we can invite, oh, sorry, my bad. There's a microphone in that yellow coated jacket man's, Andrew's hand. <laughs> um, he will go around and hold it for you if you have a question. So maybe if you could wave your hand and maybe as you think about some questions that you might want to ask Hubert, I just want to take this moment to just really say thank you. Thank you for sharing of the richness of your home culture and the ways that you embody the Trinity mm. and the way that God has been embodying in your community, embodying in your story. And I just really feel that, like that is the marking of the, the spirit in you and you, you share that with us. And so what an honor it is mm. to receive that. Thank you so much. Yeah. So we have a first question, it's from Jack. No, sorry, Noah. Oh, hair cut through you off. Um, thank you, Hubert. I just wanted to first say thank you for that wonderful exposition on the Trinity to start off. That was really, really beautiful and clearly stated, and uh, it, was, it was just lovely. I, I wanted to ask about um, your, uh, I wanted to ask a little bit about your family experience, because you said you grew up in a household that was Christian, and in the, the experience that you related to us, you talked about this journey to find this meeting of your Christian and indigenous identities. Was that something that you saw represented in some of the people before you in your family, um, such that it was something you sort of grew into? Or was it, did it feel like it was a new thing for you, a new kind of synthesis that, that you hadn't seen uh, in, uh, among other initial people. Yeah. Thank you. Jack? No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, I grew up in a Christian family. Like I said, my grandparents were Christian. Uh, on both sides of my family, my aunties and uncles were Christian. I, I was the kid who went to Sunday school. I was the kid who played in the pews during worship. I was the kid that was asleep under the pews during worship. <laughs> Uh, I grew up in that environment uh, until uh, about, I guess, like any typical teenager, I kind of, my parents let me wander and do my own thing at that point, and I didn't attend church, I didn't do, do the Sunday school thing anymore, and I kind of became a rebel without a cause, mm -hmm. and, um, and like I said, uh, that was in my teenage years, and got into all kinds of mischief, and then in 2010, my mother passed away, and my heart got shattered into a million pieces, needless to say, and uh, the way I came to God is another whole story in itself, but long story short, I, I found myself one day at my Inglewood Church Army, and I remember walking into that church army. It was very quiet. I peeked in the door, because <laughs> it was so quiet, and I saw the lights on, and all of a sudden, everyone peeked back at me. <laughs> 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 and they were, they were having a Bible study. And I, remember, I walked into that, to the church army, and I remember feeling this peace that I've never felt before. Mm -hmm. Um, but it was the peace that I've lacked in my life because I was I was struggling even before my mother passed away. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I was struggling even before my mother passed away, and uh, I tried to do my do my best to get get everything together for myself, but I never could. 
But I remember walking into that place and feeling this presence and this peace and this love that I never felt before. And I kind of had an idea of what it was because of the environment I grew up in. But I, they invited, they, they pulled up a chair, helped me sit in the Bible study, and I was studying Ephesians. And I went back for Wednesday services and Sunday services and kept going back and kept going back. And uh, I come from a church around the tradition, and it's a very, I guess, informal, low church type of tradition. And then I sat under the leadership of a lot of my aunties and uncles, especially my aunties. They would preach the love of God and Jesus. And I just remember during one of our weekend rallies and just hearing. Um, one, of, one of the preachers preached, and I just remember bawling my eyes out, and my heart was broken, but I just also felt that peace coming to me, and I just, at that moment, I just gave all the garbage that I had in my life to God, and God gave me His love, and ever since then, I've been on this, on this walk, this journey that I'm on, and I don't, I don't recall a lot of my, I remember hearing a lot of these stories uh, from other people, but I've never, none of my family have ever experienced, or shared with me that their experience of anything of trying to reconcile mm. their Michigan culture and their Christian mm. identity. And, I, and again, I think it just has a lot to do with the way Christianity was brought to us. Mm. You know, you had to be one and be mm. That was the very evangelical tradition that was expressed in our community. And so a lot of our people just embraced Christianity and kind of didn't really disown our Michigan culture, but they didn't like, try to find that mm. peace between that. I like how you mentioned that I guess it's a lot to do with how Christianity was brought to you. My name is Michelle. Michelle. Yeah. Um, Ojibwa and I'm Ontario. And I'm French. And uh, I like how you said that Christianity was brought, it was how Christianity perhaps was brought to your people. And um, and the parallels that you were able to see between Christianity and that. One of the things I've always thought about was, geez, you know, I wish they would simply asked us when they landed in Canada, you know, hey, what, what's your way? And then see the parallels, in fact, you know, uh, between our, 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 our views on our Creator and, and their views. And so I just wanted to say thank you for sharing that with you. It's, uh, somehow I, I have this thought that uh, the only way to come into Christ is through some massive trauma. And it's refreshing to hear that, you know, somebody cared enough approaching their peoples to, to, to bring Jesus Christ to you in, in the right way. I knew it had to have happened somewhere. Yeah. So, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting. Like I said, I come from the Church Army tradition, which is an Anglican tradition by, by heart. Uh, the Anglicans weren't the first ones to arrive in the Michigan Valley, the Methodists were. Uh, the Methodists were very black and white, evangelical, good and evil. Of course, we were evil. Uh, they, they took all our, you know, especially in, in Lech Galzef, like I said, our cultural dance groups, we have songs that are specific to communities, and this specifically happened in Lech Galzef, the community where the missionaries, the Methodists, they, they took the regalia, they took the totem poles, they took the drums, they took everything about our cultural put it in the center of the community, light a fire, watched it burn. And then they left us. <laughs> they left us. <sighs> Which is, yeah, the Methodists. But they left us, but then the Anglicans came. Their approach was so different for us. Mm -hmm. They came, they lived with us. They, they, they actually had their own house. They got, they, they had, right beside the church, they thought it was called the mission house. They lived with us. They did, the, they did so much that they learned our language, they learned our culture, they did their best to embody God's love mm -hmm. our versus trying to change us completely. Mm -hmm. They even like, let us, let us uh, they taught us to help become leaders in the church and they let us use a regalia in the church. Mm -hmm. You know, they lived with us, they laughed with us, they cried with us, they experienced life with us. And ever since then, Anglicans, Anglicanism is kind of stuck in our valley. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Donna will ask a question, but is it okay if I just, is it okay if I ask a question to follow up on that? Like, you embody peace. I feel like that's mm -hmm. kind of who you are. Mm -hmm. But there are so many, like, even just that story is so angry. There is so much trauma and pain that you've witnessed to, that your people have witnessed to. So how did you get from a place of 
becoming this peaceful person that you are today when you know that it wasn't that easy? I guess that would come from some of the differences between Christianity and indigenous spirituality. You know, Christianity can be very intellectual doctrine. Mm -hmm. This is what I believe. You know, blah, 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 blah. I remember being in a Trinitarian thought class and being so bored. Yeah. <laughs> it was so dense yeah. and so boring. Yeah. One day we spent like an entire three hours arguing. Now, who sent the Holy Spirit? Was it God or was it Jesus? <laughs> I'm like, does it matter? He's already at the table. <laughs> but I just. And what the indigenous perspective would be, we're very experiential. Yeah. Like when I joined my cultural dance group, uh, I didn't have a song book. Nobody taught me any words. I got thrown in the drum line, mm -hmm. handed a drum. Mm -hmm. I had to learn how to drum to keep one of the beats, because there's three different beats we play. But I had to watch and I had to listen to people's mm -hmm. pronunciation of words, and that's how I learned the lyrics to, to, a, to a lot of our songs. But that is also how I came to know the love of God, like I shared with you. My theology is pretty simple. God loves us all. It took a lot for me to arrive at that point. Um, there were, I had a lot of ups and downs in my life, a lot of very challenging times, times where I gave up. I just was in the deepest, darkest valley, and I wanted, I wanted, you know, absolutely wanted nothing to do with God. I even gave him the silent treatment. <laughs> I, stopped, I stopped praying. I stopped praying to him. I stopped going to church. I was going through a major health struggle. I didn't know whether I was going to live or die. At this point, I was about three, four years into my walk with God, and I was doing my best to take care of myself health-wise. I was doing my best to live out His love, and I started I going through this deep, challenging period of my life where I didn't know I was going to live or die. And I got so angry with God, I even threw my Bible across the wall at the wall, and if He wasn't present with me, I probably would have shoved Him, shoved Him. And it was at one of those moments, although there was one thing I, I didn't stop doing, when I didn't know it was matter to God, I never stopped reading my Bible. I just kept reading my Bible. Mm -hmm. I knew there had to be some explanation for what I was going through mm -hmm. there. Something that I, I just knew that God was there with me. Mm -hmm. Even though I didn't understand it, I didn't feel it, couldn't see it around me. Mm -hmm. But I just kept reading my Bible. I kept reading my Bible. And then I eventually made it to Habakkuk. I think it's the end of the, end of the chapter when he's talking about, you know, there's no, I can't remember, I'll cut up my head, what he's talking about. There's no, you know, there's no cattle on the stalls. There's no lines on the trees. There's basically no reason to praise you. And yet I will say, I will praise you. I will praise you. I love you. And I was there in that moment. I remember feeling God's God's presence in my life and just feeling this love, this immense deep love kept coming to me. I was like, I know you're angry. I know you're angry. It's like, I still love you. I still love you. I still love you. And then that's... That's been one of the more foundational experiences of my life when I learned the, the deep love of God. When mm -hmm. I could just go right get angry with God and give him everything that I had pent up in my heart, give him the silent treatment, and he still loved me. Yes. And that's one of the, was the experience of that that helped me to be able to, to walk in, in that type of love. Um, thank you so much for what you've shared, Hiva. Um, it's powerful and beautiful, and it shows your tenacity as a person, but also God's tenacity with you. Mm -hmm. I'm really curious about what your friends, your Nishka friends, up on the land, back home, thought of you, like seeing this change in you. Like, mm. what, what's kind of how did they respond to that? Um, mostly good. Mostly good. Um, like I said, I got into a lot of trouble before I started this walk. I was, I was a very big pothead. I partied quite a bit, and a lot of my friends didn't believe me when I initially had this uh, change in my life. I had one friend, especially his name was Mike. Along with us, rest in peace. And when he would, he, he didn't believe me. He came by my, he came by my every every day. He said, "You want to smoke? You want to smoke?" I'm like, "No." He's like, "No." I was like, "That's not me anymore." And then a week later, he'd come by, the same thing. A month later, he'd come by, same thing. Two months later, he'd come by, same thing. And then finally, he stopped. And I was like, Mike, you want to smoke? He's like, yeah, right, that's not you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I was also fortunate that I was, it was a time uh, when, I guess, the spirit was moving in my community now. So I had a lot of my friends who, were, who, were, who, who came present with me in church mm -hmm. as well at the same time.
I'm just curious, um, what are some of your hopes for your community, you know, after you going through this journey and kind of arriving where you're at? And just kind of like when you when you pray or imagine or hope for what's next? What I'm pretty hopeful for the peace in my community. Um, mm. And yeah, there's been a the generational trauma is still very present. Mm. It manifests itself in alcoholism and drug abuse and physical abuse. You know, I'm no stranger to that type of environment as well. But I pray a lot for the peace of my community that uh, that we would step away from from that type of life, but also just to embrace who we are as as Indigenous people. Like my, like I said, I, my Nishka culture. Helped, helped me to become who I am today. Because mm -hmm. um, like I, I was nervous before I came here today and I reminded myself that I'm not coming by myself. Mm -hmm. It's like I have my family with me, I have my ancestors with me, mm -hmm. God, I have the spirit with me, God's with me. And I just kept reminding myself that over and over again as I, as I came here today, that I'm not here on my own. Mm -hmm. And when I do speak, I'm gonna trust that these are their words that are gonna fall on open hearts and open ears. And that God would move, because I can't do anything by myself. I'm just, one person, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I just really hope that my community uh, would heal, mm -hmm. heal, because I know I've had the, the privilege of being able to travel, and I know that the stories, no matter where you go, the stories are very similar, no matter where you go, for Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a prayer that I have for not my, just my community, but for all Indigenous people. We have time for the, this question, and maybe one more. So gather those questions. So Wendy's first, and then Jenny. Any other burning questions? Okay. Hi, my name is Wendy. Uh, I wanna just say that I really appreciated your, I think like calm pride and holding both your cultural heritage and your spiritual heritage. And I think in, your story or your sharing, I hear that part of spiritual formation for you is knit together with cultural formation. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious as to if you have any ideas or suggestions or postures that you feel like a church can take to nurture that for people in their community. So especially for indigenous folks or people of color who identify, um, I guess, from cultures that are non-dominant, non-Western, given that church culture equates to Western culture, typically. Do you have any ideas of how to encourage that, whether what you do at BST or what you would like to see happen, I guess? That's a very loaded question. <laughs> That's a big question. I can't really share one specific thing. And again, I, I, you bring me back to why I share this. I share, I share this in hopes that when you see Indigenous people, and you see something different that we don't fully understand, that you would give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, like I said, we're still in the process of, of journeying and understanding and building that relationship back together. I got to have to preach at uh, a church a couple of weeks ago, and I shared, uh, you know, I, I shared, I preached, and I shared one about God's love because, like, I'm kind of a, a one sermon guy on my right hook, so I was going to be God loves you. <laughs> and I'm always going to come back to that, and He loves you immensely. And, I was sharing about it, but then at the end of the service, this one lady came up to me and she's like, she's like, I watched this documentary on TV. It was about these indigenous peoples and they were singing songs and they were doing these ceremonies and they were worshiping devils. It's like, I heard all of you guys worship devils. And I was like, no. Who are you guys like, you know, just weren't you listening to my sermon? You know I mean? But I, I just did my, I did my best. I was like, I was like well, like I can't speak for all indigenous peoples. I can only speak for who I am, my experiences, and my walk, and what I've been through. I tell you, it's like they're like, no, it's like we're not all worshiping devils. We're not all, you know, heathens. It's like a lot of our songs we were we're singing like I hope you ain't. It's it's a two day celebration. We're making it through one of the darkest times of the year, and we're singing songs about what we do through that time, about how we harvest, but we're also singing spiritual songs and songs to to God of thanks and praise. Forgiveness and blessing us with such a beautiful land and such beautiful ways of knowing and being. And yeah, just, I, yeah, that's, that's a tough one, but it's just like keep an open heart. Mm -hmm. Especially when you see something that 
you don't fully understand them or you make an issue uncomfortable about it. Because like I said, it's, it's, we're still doing our best. Even as Indigenous people, they're embracing who we are as Indigenous peoples. Like I said, uh, most peoples have no, no issue with, uh, with uh, Christianity, especially the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Like I said, he shares a lot of the values and ethics that we do as Indigenous peoples. But when it comes to the institution of the church itself, mm -hmm. that's when things get really messy. Mm -hmm. It gets really messy. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Jenny. Um, I think you might have just answered my question, <laughs> but I'll try to ask it anyway, because I'm still trying to figure out how to formulate it. Um, and so, I, I come from a small town just outside of Seattle, very white, very evangelical, very, uh, you know, like our way is the right way, so that's where I came from and have been in this very long journey of, um, yeah, understanding how to contextualize the gospel and how to understand it within different cultures. Um, and how I've, okay, pre prefix to the question, um, how I've been trying to understand it from my own background is I'm realizing now that I have a little bit of distance from that is that there's a lot of stuff within my church background that was not Jesus focused mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. And yet we're so quick to embrace it within that culture. Um, and so what I'm trying to figure out for myself, and I like I don't know if this is, I think you just answered this, but how do you discern within your culture what is what is of God? And maybe the question is how do I discern that <laughs> in my culture? Like what is spirit breathed from God? And then what is uh, something that's kind of like already put that aside and like not engage with that for now. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like I said, we're, um, indigenous people are very experiential. I've been very experiential. Like I said, I came from the evangelical tradition. Uh, the church on me is very evangelical. And I remember when I first came, came to God and started going to church and uh, I, knew, I was new to the Bible and reading it for myself personally. I was on my where finally I had a face to face encounter, so to speak, with God that set me on this path that I'm on. And I often had people telling me that I shouldn't do this or I shouldn't do that. You know, I can't dress like this. You know, I can't wear that. I shouldn't say this. I shouldn't say that. Don't get tattoos. Don't pierce your ears. And I remember I spent a lot of time in the Gospels when I first came to God. And I, like I said, I just remember reading all about Jesus and saying that it wasn't about the rules, it wasn't about the do's and don'ts, it wasn't about these boxes that we try to get chucked in and say this is the way it's got to be. Um, I, it was all about God's love. I learned more and more about God, that God's love that allowed me to be more at peace with who I am, that even if uh, who I am, some of who I am causes disagreement with somebody else, I'm okay with that. <laughs> you know, that it's my relationships between me and God. You know, people are not allowed to have their, their own thoughts and points of view and opinions, and I respect that as well, and I love them as well. Like I, I do, like I said, I just have my best to live out the foundation of love that God has so richly shown me, and I do have my best to share that with everybody. And that is also one of the ways that I can help discern what is from God and what is not from God. And it's the same way you can do with the scriptures. Like if you just read them and spend time with them, don't immediately like take them at face value and say, just because this is one statement in the verse, I'm gonna take it, you run with it, you spend time with it, you meditate on it, you munch on it, you chew it, and then if it starts to bear fruit, especially like love and kindness, if you deliver it up in a good way, then the chances are, you know, it is grounded in something like God has his little little fingerprints on it. Something that we can do. If there's a burning question, you have to ask this because the Lord has told you to ask this. <laughs> Let it be now. <laughs> yeah.
Creator God, how beautiful it is that you have placed your image in humanity Mm -hmm. and that you have done so by creating us in the image of your relationality. Mm -hmm. God, I thank you for the way in which you have placed Hubert in this world, the way in which you have gifted his mind and his Mm -hmm. heart, the way in which you have uh, guided his words. We thank you for this precious offering that he has given to us. We pray that it will lead us to remember that you are the God who breaks down walls between our relationships, who breaks down barriers that would divide us, and still celebrates us for the individuals and the individual peoples and cultures that we come from. God, we pray for the flourishing of Hubert's community, for the continued good work that you are doing through the program at VST. Mm -hmm. And we pray that as we as a church um, meditate on the words you have spoken through your child, Hubert, that you would stir up good questions, uh, insights on how you are calling us to live through your spirit. We look forward to feasting with Hubert and asking these questions in a few weeks' time. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Creator. 